you here at First Morning, and it is my delight to welcome every single one of you uh, to worship this morning as we prepare to encounter the Holy Spirit in a new and fresh way as we lift up the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, friends, just a few words of announcements before we continue our worship. First of all, uh, if oh, well, actually, I want to begin with a praise today. I was so happy to hear uh, that from Scott Grant a few moments ago that he uh, was at the doctor's this week, and they have said that he is cancer-free. They have been able to see him again. He is so good. Thank you for, for blessing us with that, uh, that good news, Scott. Also want to let everybody know that this afternoon at 4 p.m. will be a church council meeting. So if you're on the church council, we hope that we'll see you there. And there's one other announcement, but I'm going to turn it over uh, to Brother Jeremiah here to uh, make that. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Okay, so you know that there are important holidays like Christmas, Easter, and Chili Cook-Off, right? Okay, so today is Chili Cook-Off, and this is what Jesus wants you to do. To go to the Chili Cook-Off, even if you've only got like coins, whatever it is, go to your vehicle, find an old penny, anything you can do to donate today because this helps us on our mission trip. And we are blessed with a church that's mission-minded and a church that, that has young people that really want to get out there and spread the gospel. And this is what we're continuing to do. So please support us. And it's mandatory. And you don't want to see my cop back. How about that? All right. Yes, and this is going to be a very, very important addition to being, no doubt, delicious. Uh, the fact that this will uh, uh, help the gospel go out into the world with our, with our youth. And so that is. And also the fact that we'll get to fellowship together. And that's part of God's will and God's plan for his church as well is that we would, uh, we would fellowship one with another and break bread together. So we will do that in two ways today. One at the Holy Table, and then again over in the, uh, in the Family Life Center. Friends, would you now rise as you're comfortable, greet those around you in the name of Jesus Christ.
Friends, let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith that is this week the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
remain standing as you're comfortable for the reading of God's most holy word. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation to St. John in the 15th chapter. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels, the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. seven weeks, and uh, today our portion comes in the 15th and 16th chapters. What you just heard me read was the whole of the 15th chapter, relatively short chapter. And uh, as I've been doing every week, I just want to offer a reminder, both for those who've been here every week and, and for those who haven't, and those for maybe who are joining us uh, for the first time in this series today, but a quick reminder of the fact that uh, as complicated as Revelation is in a lot of ways, both in its structure and its imagery, its message as a whole is actually a very simple one. And I want to reinforce once again right up front what the message of Revelation is, and we'll look at an iteration of that today. The message of Revelation is simply this. Christ wins, Satan loses. Good wins, evil loses. God's people win. The dark powers of this world lose. And through the, this uh, beautiful and sometimes terrifying but the complex array of, of images, the Apostle John shows us this vision that he saw from Christ. And so it's laid out in, in many different ways, but that message, that one simple message runs all through the book. And I also want to remind us, as I have every week, of the, the context in which this originally came. Because that will be helpful to us. And that is, the risen Christ gave this vision, this prophecy to the Apostle John to encourage and strengthen and give hope to real small communities of churches, seven churches that were named in that, in that second, chapter, second and third chapters. Small communities, to encourage those small communities as they were uh, being... Um, Rejected and in some cases persecuted, in some cases uh, even killed for their testimony to Jesus Christ. And it's in the midst of all those struggles, that suffering and pain, that this message comes to the church. And it is indeed a message of comfort and strengthening. And we come, as we come into this new section of Revelation, we find ourselves once again in the heavenly throne room. If you've been with us for a few weeks, you've seen that maybe not every time, it might be every time, but almost every one of these sections, we find ourselves in the great throne room of God. 
and we see things uh, sort of uh, from heaven's perspective for just a moment. And this section is no different because we begin in the heavenly throne room and we read that there uh, were angels who came forth with these bowls and that there was a multitude of those, it says, who had conquered, those who had held fast to the testimony of Christ, who were singing a song. Now, I'll take a moment just to look at that song. It calls it the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now, there is a song of Moses in the Old Testament. If we were to look in Exodus chapter 15, we would find the song that the, the people of God, the children of Israel, sang with Moses. Uh, when they had been delivered from the Egyptians. Maybe you remember the story of the Red Sea, where the people of Israel had escaped from the Egyptians, and they had to walk through on dry land to the Red Sea, and, and as the Egyptians were, were coming after them to, to attack them and bring them back into slavery, the, the sea closes over them, and there is victory for God's people over the those who would oppress them and who would uh, harm them. That's what we find, it's called the Song of Moses. There's also another version of that song in Deuteronomy chapter 32. But what we, we, we read here as the song that they are singing, it's not exactly that same song of Moses. It's not the same words we find in the Old Testament. And that's because it's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Remember, we're dealing in many cases with symbols here. And... Uh, uh, what I believe, and I have good reason to believe, that when it talks about the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, we're talking about the, the, the unified message of God to humanity throughout all history, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The law that was given to Moses and the law that was interpreted to us through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so they're singing this song, the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, they're singing this song that in some way encapsulates or sums up or runs all through the testimony of God to his people. And what does that song say? Well, among the many things that the song says are these phrases. Just and true are your ways. You alone are holy. Your righteous acts have been revealed. You see, there's a, a focus on the justice of God, the truthfulness and goodness of God, the righteousness of God, which is very similar to justice. The song of Moses and the Lamb is a song of, of God's goodness and justice, very simply. And that indeed is what we find all through the testimony of Scripture. God is good and loving and God is just and holy. And I want to dwell on this for a minute because for many people, this pairing right here uh, can be very difficult to put together. Both Christians and non-Christians alike, even for those who have been Christians all their lives, we sometimes may struggle with this question of the goodness and the justice of God. Because on the one hand, if God is a God who will be just, and that is to say, who will punish sin and evil and injustice, well then can God also be a God of love and forgiveness and grace? And we often see these two images of God pitted against one another, as if it can't be, it has to be one or the other. But friends, I, I tell you, if, if, if you read if you read through your Bible, I think you will find, I think you'll agree to me that. It's not one or the other, but it's both. We see a God who is just and holy, and who will uh, judge and who will destroy sin, and also a God who is good and loving and forgiving. And it's so important for us to acknowledge that, that it, is, it is not one or the other, but both. We can't pit Jesus against the Old Testament as though the grace of Christ cancels out the justice of God. No, they, they live together, and that's what we'll find throughout this entire chapter. Notice that, uh, that this, I've entitled the sermon, The Wrath of God, which is a very fun phrase. Uh, uh, 
And it's a kind of scary phrase. And it is, um, I think, also a misunderstood phrase in a lot of ways. So let's think about this for a minute. What is the wrath of God? What does that mean? If you were to look like at an English dictionary at the word wrath, it would probably say something like uh, extreme anger, furious anger, something like that. And that's a pretty decent definition of, of wrath. But when we're talking about the wrath of God, when we see the wrath of God mentioned in Scripture, every time, every time, it's going to be God's wrath against, not in, just in general, but God's wrath, God's anger at injustice and sin and evil. God's not a, a God that's just a, there's, you've, you've probably heard some caricatures of the angry Old Testament God that's just mad about everything and just wants to destroy it. But that's not what we find in Scripture. We find a God who is holy and just, and who will not let injustice stand, who will not let sin stand, who will not let evil stand. And it's these that produce the, the anger, the righteous anger of God. It's a good thing, the wrath of God. It's right for God to be angry about injustice and sin and evil, right? Imagine a God that doesn't distinguish right from wrong. Imagine a God that doesn't distinguish good from evil. Imagine a God who, who lets injustice happen with impunity, lets injustice happen just left and right with no consequences. Imagine a God under whose authority sin and evil and injustice can just do their thing and never pay for it, never come to an end. It wouldn't seem like much authority at all, would it? And so we want God to be angry in this way, at injustice. Look at the injustices in the world around us. Look at the evil and the sin in the world around us. We want God to oppose that. We want God to correct that. We want God to set things right. And so it's good that God has wrath against sin and evil and injustice. But then we might uh, encounter another question in our minds, or another, another block, something, another uh, difficulty, which we might say, okay, granted that it's good for God to oppose sin and evil and injustice, okay, granted that, but doesn't Jesus teach us that we ought to forgive one another and love one another? So how do these things fit together? Is it a, a contradiction? That God would, 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 would punish or would, would be angry against sin, but, but that Jesus would tell us we have to forgive. Shouldn't God be more like us? More forgiving? Well, no. And this is so important. Because the basis of our forgiveness, our ability, our command to forgive others, it's based on the wrath of God, on the justice of God. And here's what I mean by that. When someone harms us, when someone wrongs us, when someone opposes us and slanders us, and whatever it may be, it's very clear that we're called, ultimately, to forgive. But the way we do that is not to just say that it doesn't matter, that the harm doesn't matter, that the evil doesn't matter, that the injustice doesn't matter. No, what, forgiveness is, is taking that, it, that, that harm, taking that and handing it to God and saying, God will judge. God will handle this. God himself says in, in several places in the Old Testament, I will avenge. Right? Do, not, do not avenge yourselves. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. I will repay, he says. And so when we forgive, we're entrusting 
that pain, we're trusting that person, we're trusting that sin and that injustice to God. And I want to be very careful here, because I had a very, very helpful question at the end of, of the last service. Because someone asked me, okay, so we're supposed to forgive, but what if someone, what about crime? What if someone breaks the law? Are we often to just forgive someone? And, and I don't have time to go into that, uh, all the way into that. But no, this is accounted in, in God's plan, that there would be a just government that would justly restrain evil in certain ways, that would, that would uh, uh, you know, take perpetrators off the street. Right? Just because you have to forgive somebody doesn't mean you should not call the police. I want that to be very clear. Forgiveness isn't about um, letting the, the law be nothing. But forgiveness is about not letting that vengeance eat away at you on the inside. And it's not about personally reaching out to harm the, one, the ones who have harmed you. That's why God instituted government in general in the world. And that's what on the last day God will ultimately do. We'll see that justice is done. So the very reason that we can forgive and should forgive someone is because God will handle it for us in the end. And God is wiser than we are. And God's ways are holier than ours are. And so it's better off in his hands anyway. Forgiveness says, I release this into God's hands. And that's what Christ calls us to do. Because the fact of the matter is, though we may not... Um, Offend in the same way that we have been offended. We may not see ourselves in the same way. We may not do the same things as those who, uh, who who hurt us in some way, or who insult us in some way, or oppose us. We may not do the same thing. But friends, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That means that we all must answer to the justice of God. But for those who are in Christ. <coughs> For those who have entrusted their lives, their hearts, their souls unto Jesus Christ. We'll find that he took our debt. He took what we deserve in our place. And remember that Jesus is God. There's not, a, there's not Jesus doesn't save us from an angry God. But God loves you so much that he would rather suffer the penalty of your sin and your evil and your injustice and to let it fall on you. And all he asks is your trust. The only way that we can face the justice of God is through what Christ did for us. And so we, we shouldn't see ourselves as better than those whom we are called to forget. Better than those who harm us. No. But in Christ, he sees us as so much more. And so we step into chapter 16 now. That was chapter uh, 15. And we find that the image we have is of these seven angels. And they go and they pour these bowls of wrath, we read, out upon the earth. Now you may remember if you've been with us a few weeks that uh, we've seen something similar. Uh, this is the third time now. There was seven seals. Seven seals upon a scroll that were broken. And each time the seal was broken, there was some kind of calamity, some kind of uh, disaster, some kind of, of pain that, was, that, that happened in the earth. And what we found when we looked at that chapter was not that this was a series of things that are going to happen in the future leading up to the end, but these are things that that early church who had been uh, offended against, who had been opposed, who had been harmed in so many ways, that early church would have, would have uh, seen the world around them and said, yeah, I know about uh, what, it means, what it's like to be poor in the struggle. I know what it's like to be sick and feel pain. I know what it's like to be persecuted. I know what it's like to be harmed by someone. We see, they see that in the world around them. We also found that the, another similar uh, image with the seven trumpets. In the same way, each time these trumpets uh, sounded, there was some kind of calamity, some kind of disaster that happened in the earth. And likewise, we can find that that early church, in fact, we can look around our world and say, we don't have to wait until the end days for that. We see that now. That's, that is our world. 
And we see something very similar with these seven bowls of wrath. Uh, they fit, they're very, many of them sort of uh, look like or mimic the plagues of, the, uh, of uh, Egypt. Remember again the story of when Moses brought the children of Israel out of slavery. It was through uh, these plagues that God sent upon Egypt that finally Pharaoh uh, let the people go. And so some of these plagues we see here are sim very similar to that. They're not, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's a very similar uh, uh, circumstance. And we read in Exodus 12 that the plagues ultimately were a, a, a judgment upon the false gods of Israel. So likewise, when these angels pour these bowls upon the earth, it's a judgment upon all that is opposed to God and to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And that the lies of the evil one stir up the people of the world against God and against his people. But ultimately, Christ wins. That's just the quickest possible uh, summary of chapter 16. But how does this apply to us? What is it about? Why do we keep seeing these, uh, these, these seals, these trumpets, these bowls? If we're talking about the same thing ultimately, why do we, why do we keep seeing it over and over again? What I think we can see here is that it may show us three similar images, but we see three different responses. And I think that's what this is about. Here's what I mean by that. Because for, for, for believers, for those who trust in God and trust in Christ, the very same calamities, the very same suffering looks a lot different than someone who has not trusted in Christ. And even that looks very different than someone who has rejected him altogether. And I believe that's what we see. Here, when we look at the seven seals, here's what we said. We said that That for believers, they see that the suffering and the trials that are displayed there, these are ultimately just a part of living in a broken world. It's a part of living in a world that is, where there is sin and there is brokenness. But, but for those who trust in God to carry them through it, we find that despite it all, despite the pain, despite the opposition, despite the way that we hurt, we find strength from God to endure. We even find God comforting us. We find God strengthening us. We find God shaping us into different people. Maybe you've had a, a very painful experience in your life, and if you had to do it over again, you wouldn't. You'd say, no, I don't want to go through that again. And rightly so. But did you find that on the other side of it, there was some blessing. There was some change. There was something in you that grew stronger through that pain. This is what believers find in our everyday struggles. But it's really easy for us to, um, I can't dwell on this too long because we're going to run out of time, but it's very easy even for those who, who, who put all of our trust in Christ, it's very easy to just dwell on our suffering here in this world. And, and certainly it gets our attention because it, it can be really horrible. And I think we do this in part because we forget that as important as this life is, and it is, you can't read the Bible and come away thinking that our life here on earth and everything we experience now doesn't matter. But we forget is that this life, this difficult life here on earth, it's just like the opening credits to a movie that never ends. It's only a small part of the life that we will have that never ends with Christ. And so we hold fast to the strength that he gives us. But then we saw it with the trumpets that appropriately the pain and suffering we endure in this life, it's like a trumpet call. It's like an alarm getting our attention. Calling out to us and saying, pay attention. 
Pay attention to the one who loves you, who's calling you, saying, come to me, and I'll give you comfort. Come to me, and I'll give you eternal life. It's like we, should, we can see the, the, the pain and the disaster in our lives as a, a call to turn toward God, both for those who haven't trusted in him yet, to, to turn toward God, turn toward Christ, and even for those who've been Christians all our lives. It can be a wake-up call to grow closer to him, to cling more tightly to him. And now we see these bowls of wrath. And this one is different. Because what we find here are those who, despite the, the, the arms of God being extended out to them and the grace being offered to them, say no, no. In fact, what do they do? We read in uh, verses 9, 10, 11, they did not repent and give him glory. They cursed the God of heaven for their pain and their sores. Multiple times in here we see that, that these, the way they respond is, is neither of, of the ways that we've seen before, but to curse God. To blame God, to spitefully reject God. They're rejecting that strength, that consolation. They're rejecting uh, the blood of Christ that was shed for them. They're rejecting forgiveness. They're rejecting so much and for them the pain and disaster and the struggles that we all face in this life. It's like a confirmation of God's judgment. And this is sad, friends, and I, I, uh, I don't want to dwell on this too long except to say there are people in our lives who need that hope who need that consolation, who need to know that there's forgiveness and there's strength and there's support and there's eternal life in Christ, and they don't know that. And many of them, they're cursing God for their struggles. They may not say it that way, but they're blaming God for their struggles. They are rejecting Him. Let's not let that stand. Let's not let that stand. Not on our watch. But we see that that is, uh, is ultimately something that is possible and will take place. So what does this mean for us, friends? Just to reiterate what we've already said. Because of the hope we have in Christ, we can face the trials of this life. In the same way that the early church persevered, and not only that, grew, grew from a few small communities scattered across uh, the province of Asia and, and the province that the, the province of what was they called Palestine, we probably call Israel now. Uh, that through all, all that province, the church not only survived, but it grew. And the fact that we're here is evidence of that. That they were able to hold on to that faith and to share that faith. And that through the trials they were suffering, we ultimately have come to know Christ. And the same can be true of us. As we extend the kingdom of God out all over the Holy Globe through the gospel, through sharing the good news of the love of Christ and the free forgiveness and repentance to Christ. And we can also be assured that the, the injustices the evil that we see around us, the things that are sometimes even too horrible to think about, the things that are on the news, the things we don't like to think about, they won't be left to stand in the end. That injustice will be set right. And goodness and love will prevail where now we see evil and injustice. Thanks be to God. That he is a just God. Thanks be to God that he is a loving God. Thanks be to him. That through his son, we have hope no matter what. Would you pray with me? Holy God, it's astounding to consider your goodness and holiness in the face of the injustice in our world. 
But God, we, we come to you with trust and with hope and with certainty that in you all will be made well within our souls, within our world. And God, we pray that you would give us the strength to hold fast to you, that you would give us the strength to reach out to those who are lost and need your hope and need your strength and need you, your son. Give us the strength to do that, O oh Lord. As we walk toward eternal life in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we come now to the time when we gather around Christ's table. And uh, this table is for everybody. And I'm going to give you an invitation here in a moment. And if you can see yourself in this invitation, these three things, then that means you belong here at this table. And we hope that you'll come. We trust that you will. And here's that invitation. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, who seek to live at peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. We were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us now join together, friends, in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. It is a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water the Spirit. The night in which He gave Himself up for us, He took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, He gave it to His disciples, saying to them, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, He took the cup. He gave thanks to you, and He gave it to His disciples, saying to them, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's effort for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world till Christ comes in final victory. We feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, friends, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
forgive us. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For the communion service, please. Friends, if you're uh, in need of gluten-free bread, there are some that are sort of in the middle, so if you want to come down there and, and then come to the, the rail, um, that would be the way to do that. Also, if you prefer to use the prepackaged uh, stuff for whatever reason, there are prepackaged uh, cups and wafers here on the altar rail that you are invited to use. Friends, the table is set. Once you come, taste and see that the Lord is good.